in many ways, something that marks our time is a polarization of ideology. You know what I'm talking about. Maybe you're with that family member or that friend and that topic comes up. For different people, it can be different things. Maybe it's a sports debate. Who's the greatest hockey player of all time? And you guys just can't agree. But more often than not, it's not so trivial. It digs in a little closer to who you are. Maybe it's a political party that the topic comes up and you end up in opposite camps. And the conversation takes on a bitterness. Maybe it's a theological position. Maybe it's a view of God. Maybe it's a view of uh, people. That, that you take a stance and you look at someone who takes the opposite stance and you say, how do you see the world that way? And they're on the other side saying, I don't understand how you don't see it my way. Dramatically opposite sides. And all too often, it, it, it actually can drive a wedge in relationships. Now, if you think about the biblical story, at the very beginning, God actually creates humanity with an intention of us experiencing Shalom, which is peace, wholeness, fullness in relationship. Yes, relationship with God, and yes, relationship with each other. Also the world around us. Shalom with each other. When we think of that polarized ideology, it's the opposite of shalom. It's the opposite of peace. It's the opposite of wholeness. Now, some of you may be saying, but John, this stuff matters. Who the greatest hockey player of all time truly matters. Uh, the political view truly matters. Well, friends, I get that, but who the person is matters even more. Relationship with that other person matters even more. It's interesting, one of the marks that Jesus calls the New Testament church to have is unity. Unity. And friends, can I just say this Easter Sunday, that because of the resurrection, we, as the church of Jesus Christ, are invited to live as new creation people. That means that we can let go of all of the petty disagreements and put all, all of our identity, all of our standing in the world on Jesus Christ. Not on being right about the greatest hockey player. Not on being right about the best political party or who is going to be the best for Ontario or in our city. Be because friends, let's be honest. They're all just going to mess it up. We're always going to have decisions where we second guess those in power. But we don't rely on those in power. We actually rely on Jesus Christ. We just live in the midst of those in power. We navigate it. We put up with. And yet we look beyond to Christ and his kingdom. And we try to live now in the midst of it. Resurrection Sunday. So friends, when we think about coming through that first Easter weekend, right? You can think of the triumphant entry where Jesus and his disciples made their way down from Bethphage into Jerusalem amidst the, the cries of Hosanna, Hosanna, right? And then move through Passion Week to Jesus' arrest, the trial, the crucifixion. And the immense amount of disillusionment as those who thought that the Messiah was here and the Messiah was going to lead the insurrection against Rome, freeing the Hebrews, freeing the Jews from oppression, only to wind up crucified on a criminal's cross. They thought one thing and something dramatically opposite actually 
happened. The disillusionment would have been real. The disappointment, the unknowns. So many had given their entire lives for this rabbi and his teaching and the movement he started. And now they're saying, what now? What now? Well, in the wake of it, those early Jesus followers were trying to piece it together. We're trying to figure it out. And today we want to take a look at one of those stories. We're looking in Luke 24. This is verses 13 and following. And it reads like this. Now the same day, two of them, two of the disciples, two of those who were following Jesus, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had, had happened. What I just explained, coming into Jerusalem. The shouts, the cries, the Passion Week, the arrest, the trial, the death, and also the empty tomb. They're talking about it. They're discussing it. They're trying to figure out what's going on. Where was the body? What's happening? What do we do now? So they're walking and they're discussing everything that happened. Verse 15 says, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. So there they are in the midst of their disillusionment, talking about Jesus, and he's right there and they don't get it. They don't see him. They don't understand. Now, there's a little bit of a mystery here because we don't know why they didn't understand. We didn't know why they, don't, they didn't recognize him. Maybe one day when we die and get new bodies, maybe we'll get it then. But for whatever reason, there's a little bit of a mystery in the text here. But they didn't, they didn't recognize him. Jesus was present in the midst of their turmoil, in the midst of their disillusionment, in the midst of their wrestle, their struggle, and they did not recognize his presence. How often is it the same with us in the midst of our own journey as we navigate disillusionment when Jesus is actually right there with us but we don't see him we don't acknowledge him we don't know he's with us friends even when we don't feel God's presence may we know that God is still with us in the darkest nights where we cry out to God, where are you? Why are you hiding your face from me? He's there with us. Friends, through it all, God's still present. Even if we don't feel him, hear him, understand what he's up to, God's present. But then verse 17 says, he, being Jesus, asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? What are you discussing together as you walk along? I, I love this, that Jesus is the content of their conversation. He's the focus of it all. And he asks them, hey, what are you guys talking about? The irony of that moment is thick. It's pretty funny. He gives them a chance, though, to arc articulate their understanding of everything that's played out, which is kind of funny. This is like he's giving them a test without them realizing it's a test. If they've been following him, they've been listening to him teach, they've been trying to understand the scriptures, and now as the pinnacle, the central moment of God's work in the world has just happened, and they're trying to figure it out. They're discussing everything that was going on. And Jesus says, hey, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? It's like a test without them even knowing it's a test. It's kind of, kind of humorous if you think about it. And in response to Jesus's question, verse 18, or actually the end of verse 17, they stood still. So they've been moving this whole time, talking, discussing. Jesus joined them. They keep talking. Hey, what are you guys talking about? And they stop. Jesus' question brings them to a halt. And the text actually says their faces downcast. So they, Jesus' question caused them to just stop and their jaws dropped and hit the ground. Verse 18 says, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened 
in these days. He's like, come on, man. You're on the road from Jerusalem. You were there. How do you not know? How do you not know? Did you miss it all? Where were you? Was your head in the sand? In some respects, friends, this would have been similar as a conversation with a friend on January 7th after the insurrection of the Capitol. 140 people injured, five people dead. You know, the images that played on the news screens of, of people crashing the Capitol. We see flags and crosses and signs with Bible verses painted on them amidst this crowd that's storming the Capitol. It was all a scene so hard to understand. And the whole world was talking about it. So if someone on January 7th came and said, hey, what are you guys talking about? It's like, what are you talking about? What are we talking about? How do you not know? This is what it would have been like with Jesus. How do you not know? Are you the only one in Jerusalem who did not see, did not hear, does not understand what happened with Jesus? And then we see that they go on to describe it. Jesus first answers, well, what, what things? Again, what things? And then they go on and they say, well, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. And they, so we have the, their description of all that played out. Jesus going to the cross, buried, and on this, the third day, they experienced the empty tomb, and they had no idea what it all meant, but here they now were. They had left Jerusalem. They had left the disciples. They were disillusioned. They were walking back. They were trying to figure it out. What now? Probably going back to family members, having to describe to them all that happened and the fact that, oh, you know, I left you a few weeks ago to follow Jesus. Well, he's dead. I don't know where his body is. No, no, it disappeared. I, I don't know. There would have been some uncertainty and some shame and some unknown swirling for them. And now as they describe it all to Jesus. Again, the irony is thick. Now, verse 25. He, being Jesus, said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Friends, from Jesus' own lips in this story, he says, the starting at the beginning with the books of Moses and all the way through the prophets. The story is centered on Christ himself. Jesus is the center of the story. And what's fascinating here, friends, is that it means that if this story is centered on Jesus and then Jesus started a movement and we as the church of Jesus are trying to live in the midst of that movement, then friends, this is a story that simply just speaks of where we came from. And it kind of sets a trajectory for how to live and how to be in the world. We find ourselves post-resurrection in this story, living out life within this new creation. We have time of figuring out of what Jesus is doing in this world. And part of that is, again, going back to the beginning and saying the petty things that drive wedges in between mere humans should not do the same thing in the church. Among the people of God, we get to be different. We get to actually center our lives on Christ and his story 
as it plays out in the world. So in between you and I and you and each other, we get to foster shalom, peace, wholeness, goodness. Now, that doesn't mean there's not going to be disagreements, but when disagreements occur, we lovingly work it through. When there's conflicts, we lovingly work it through. We center in on Christ and say, well, let's figure this out. All too often, we respond like the rest of the world, and we drive wedges. We let the wedges continue to go, and we be separated. Jesus is the center of the story. Jesus is the center of the story. The story that now gets to define our lives as individuals and together. The life of the church. The text continues. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now, on the one hand, this is typical of ancient hospitality. Walking along the road, Jesus, not looking to impose, pretended as if he was going to go, go further. And then the two of them saying, hey, hold up, hold up. No, 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 stay with us. Come, share a meal. It's late. We'll give you a bed. You could set out on the journey tomorrow. So it's typical of ancient hospitality. And yet, friends, as we look back on it, we can say, it's also typical of Jesus not to force himself on us. Jesus won't force himself into our lives. He won't force his story onto our stories that we're living, we actually need to invite him. We need to invite him. We need to open our lives up and say, Jesus, would you enter my story? Would you become the center of my story? He doesn't force himself. Friends, have you ever invited Jesus into your story? If you haven't done it, I ask, this could be the game-changing moment for you, if you come to redefine your existence here on earth, not by the money you can achieve, not by your popularity, not by the grades that you get in school, not by the role you play at work and pursuing that promotion, but friends, you actually define your life around Jesus. You come to see values that, and, and meaning and significance centered in on who he is and who he says we are. And friends, it's a radical game changer. It's a radical game changer. Would you invite him in? Would you invite him in? So he invites them in. So he went in to stay with them. That's the other thing. Jesus will always come in. If you invite him in, he will always come in. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Now, here's the other thing. We know that post-resurrection, Jesus, conquering the powers of sin, death, and darkness, became the one in whom all authority in heaven and on earth comes to rest. If you invite the King of kings and Lord of lords to stay at your house, you better believe you step aside and let him take the role of host at the table. You let him break the bread. You let him say grace. The irony, again, is that they did not yet know it was Jesus, and yet he stepped into the role of host, taking the bread, giving thanks, breaking it. And at that, in that moment of breaking it, their eyes are opened, and they can see Jesus for who he really is. For who he really is. Friends, Jesus, when welcomed in, becomes the host who then dictates the manners at the table. That then dictates who's welcome at the table. So the first question is, have you invited Jesus into your table, into your life, into your home, into your story? And as you do that, friends, 
he being king of kings and Lord of lords will then come to become the center of that story. And that is a good thing. But it also then means who becomes welcome at that table is defined not by your desires, it becomes, but by G- what Jesus would have. And we know later when Paul says that in Christ there's no longer any male nor female, Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, but all are one in Christ. All are welcome at the table. All are welcome at the table. When we invite Jesus in, he becomes, this new creation reality means that Jesus defines who is welcome at the table. May that be so in our personal lives and may that be so here in the church as we just try to live in the midst of the resurrection as a new creation community. As he broke bread, gave thanks, and began to give it to him. Verse 31 says, Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, Were our hearts not burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Did you notice that it was only after their eyes were opened that they could recognize the work that Jesus had been doing previously? Friends, similarly, God's at work in us. I guarantee God's at work in you whether you acknowledge it or not. And one day, if you finally acknowledge it, invite him into the story of your life and allow him to take the hospitality seat, the host seat, and you, your eyes become open to who he really is. Friends, you will recognize he's been at work long before you ever had your eyes open to him. God is at work in the world. He's at work in your life. He's at work in my life. May we have eyes to see what he's up to. There, it's, it truly is beautiful. And oftentimes, again, you acknowledge these actual uh, things going on in our bodies, a burning in our hearts, uh, 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 an enlightenment that we may have not had a name for. Or we may not have had language to describe. And it's only after our eyes become open that we see it, feel it, understand it. Friends, when we think of the reality of disillusionment versus faith, sometimes our agenda gets mixed up and we see what Jesus is actually up to. It's only after we invite Jesus into the story of our lives that we say, wait a minute, it's not about me forcing my agenda on Jesus, forcing my agenda on my family, forcing my agenda on my neighbors, forcing my agenda on my friends. It's about actually saying, well, what would Jesus have me say? What would Jesus have me do? Who would Jesus have me be in light of all that's playing out around me? All of a sudden, our conversations take on a different vibe. It's not about winning the argument. It's about actually winning the person. It's not about winning the argument. It's about winning the person. Letting them know they're loved. Letting them know that they matter. That they're valuable. Friends, we have this reality playing out here. Their God was at work in them. They recognized Jesus. Their hearts were burning. Their eyes were opened. Verse 33 says that they got up, returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and rose with them, assembled together, saying, It's true! The Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened along the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Friends, if the tomb is empty, if death has been defeated, if new creation has begun, then we, as a part of Christ's church, get to live in light of this new reality. Having the story of God that plays out in the scriptures continue to write itself in our lives as we allow Jesus to do his thing in us and through us and among us. Friends, this Easter, may we know the resurrection reality. May we live in the midst of it. 
And may we come to have our center of, of identity be rooted in who Jesus is in us. Lord Jesus, may we know that you're alive. May you continue to do work in us. May our eyes be open to you at work all around us. And may we have the courage to step into it. It's in your name we pray. Amen.